Tetralogy of Fallot, Management Strategies by Dr. Peter Lang. I'm Peter Lang. I'm a cardiologist at the Children's Hospital in Boston, and we're talking about Tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, what we're going to do now is speak about what I'm going to call garden variety Tetralogy of Fallot. That is, we're in the midst of discussing different management strategies, and they depend a bit upon how kids present and what their individual anatomy and physiology is. And we're going to take a couple of examples. Review of Basic Anatomy and Physiology. And what we're going to do right now is talk about a child with Tetralogy of Fellow who I'm going to say is plain old Tetralogy of Fellow, no bells and whistles. And as we have learned over the years, Tetralogy of Fellow does have Fallow's four components a ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, in this drawing subpulmonary stenosis, an overriding aorta, so it's a bit over the ventricular septum, and right ventricular, increased right ventricular muscle mass or right ventricular hypertrophy because the pressure in the right ventricle is high. There's transmission of high pressure from the left ventricle and there is the outflow tract obstruction. We know that really this is all because there is malalignment of the conal septum with the ventricular septum, which creates the VSD, crowds the right ventricular outflow tract between the conal septum and the free wall of the right ventricle, leading to the overriding of the aorta, and as a consequence of that, there is right ventricular muscle hypertrophy. In what I'm going to call the usual or more typical form of tetralogy of fellow, we've got our ventricular septal defect, and we have a modest amount of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. In this situation, systemic venous return comes to the right atrium, goes across the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, and the way I've drawn it, a fair amount of it, if not all, can go out to the pulmonary artery, while pulmonary venous return from the lungs and the left atrium goes across the mitral valve and then out the aorta. And this would be a balanced circulation. The blood in the aorta is fully saturated. There's no admixture of systemic venous blood, um, nor is there a lot of, um, or any, the way I've drawn it so far, of blood going from the left ventricle to the pulmonary artery. So normal pulmonary blood flow, normal systemic blood flow. Now, you can imagine that if this degree of obstruction to, right ventricular, to the right ventricular outflow tract gets a bit more severe with time, and there is a greater resistance of, to blood flow going out to the pulmonary artery, then there will be admixture of blood going to the systemic circulation, admixture of systemic venous blood or desaturated blood. And this saturation, which is 95% coming from the lungs, if, if there was no admixture of blood, the aortic saturation would be 95%. But once we add some blue blood with, let's say, a saturation of 65%, if there's a little bit of it, this saturation may be 90 if there is a lot of it, this saturation is going to get lower and lower and lower. So how, how does this happen? Well, with time, there can be increasing muscle mass in the outflow tract, perhaps stimulated by the increased contractions because of the need for, um, to generate um, pressure to get blood out of this out of this right ventricle, but sometimes kids will have what is called hypercyanotic episodes or tetralogy spells induced by a whole bunch of mechanisms that we don't fully understand. Sometimes by catecholamines, um, sometimes they can be induced by other other factors. We don't entirely understand this. We know they happen more often in the early morning hours um, than at any other time in the day. Um, we don't see a lot of them these days because 
these happen more in older kids, not in newborns, and we're tending to do reparative surgery on kids with Tetralogy of Fellow at an earlier and earlier age. So what happens when the oxygen saturation gets lower and lower and lower? We don't like to see this. And so as there's increasing obstruction, the oxygen saturation is getting lower, and you will, have, you will be cyanotic, you will have less uh, reserve with exercise and can develop all kinds of physiologic consequences. You'll get polycythemic. As a result of all of that, you are at risk for all kinds of things, um, which would include brain abscesses, kidney problems, and all of that. Management strategies. In the bad old days, um, in the 19, you know, 20s and 30s and earlier than that when people recognized Tetralogy of Fellow, they didn't have much to do about it. The m breakthrough um, that's pointed to time and time again um, came in the days before there was effective cardiopulmonary bypass um, where it was recognized that the part of the problem going on here was there just wasn't enough blood flow getting to the pulmonary arteries. And in an innovative you know, concept, um, a cardiologist, Helen Tausig, and a surgeon, um, Alfred Blaylock, and a surgical, basically, te technician, technologist, developed um, an operation that would augment pulmonary blood flow. And what they did is they took the subclavian artery, turned it down, should say, divided it, sewed it off, turned it down, and this is the subclavian artery coming down, and in that manner supplied extra pulmonary blood flow, so there was some antegrade pulmonary blood flow, then there was blood flow coming from the subclavian artery, and this is a blaylock tausig shunt and it could be done on the right side using the right subclavian artery or the left side using the left subclavian artery. And the classic teaching in those days in the late 1940s and throughout the 50s was you did the blaylock tausig shunt on the side opposite of the arch because of the, the, the sweep. This is a left arch, so we would have a right-sided shunt, um, which would give you a gentler sweep and the and the, the, the shunt stayed open uh, to a greater degree because it wasn't kinked. Um, and so that was one way of doing things. Um, it became possible um, about 10 years after, um, instead of doing a palliative operation, to doing reparative surgery. And that is instead of just getting more pulmonary blood flow so your saturation would not be 60 or 70, but 85 or something like that, um, that you could actually fix things. And the way that things were fixed in, in, with Tetralogy of Fallot would be, let's get rid of some of these lines that we've drawn. So we've got to do a couple of things to fix. Number one is we would like to close the ventricular septal defect. And so a patch can be placed, which will then leave left ventricular inflow coming from the pulmonary veins, left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, going to the aorta, put a patch there. It can't go anywhere else. Next thing that gets done is right ventricular inflow, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and then you've got this blocked pathway. If all you did was close the ventricular septal defect, you would have a right ventricle where you'd be trying to put an entire cardiac output through a very narrow passageway. And so what was done was some of the right ventricular muscle was carved away, but as I've implied by this bicuspid pulmonary valve, often the pulmonary valve annulus is small, the pulmonary valve is abnormal, and so it became recognized fairly early that, number one, you couldn't just close the ventricular septal defect, but you had to do something to the right ventricular outflow tract. 
And occasionally, if you had a normal sized pulmonary annulus and a reasonably functional pulmonary valve, you could carve out muscle. More often than not, this whole pathway was narrow and so would be enlarged by an infundibular patch. And sometimes, if the pulmonary annulus was small, you had to enlarge the whole pathway, and so you would end up putting what we refer to as a transannular patch, which would extend from within the right ventricle, and if there were extra muscle bundles here, those would be resected, it would extend across the infundibulum, or the outflow area of the, mitra, of the right ventricle, and with a transannular patch, that refers to across the narrow pulmonary valve annulus, and into the main pulmonary artery. So the, this type of approach um, was what was, became um, the standard type approach to treating Tetralogy of Fallot starting in the mid-1950s. That is, if you, you, at that time, you could not perform safe cardiopulmonary bypass in very small children, in newborns and infants and probably people were, became more comfortable with younger and younger ages um, as time went on. But initially, after this operation was introduced, if you were a small baby and you were too blue, you got palliated with a blaylock tazic shunt. Other shunts um, were developed, and they were mostly named after the people who introduced them. There was a Waterston shunt, there was a pot shunt, and several other types of shunts. So you had a baby, and if the baby got too blue, got a shunt, you would wait until they were old enough to perform cardiopulmonary bypass in a safe fashion, at which time the shunt was taken down and then reparative surgery performed, closing the ventricular septal defect and placing a right ventricular outflow tract patch to relieve obstruction. Now, with time, the strategy has changed somewhat, but is... Um, exists really as it has for 50 years conceptually. Um, that is, at an age when you could safely perform reparative surgery, you tried to do that. Um, in the current era, what are we talking about? We're talking about with the standard Tetralogy of Fellow patient who does have some outflow to the right ventricular outflow tract, does have reasonable size branch pulmonary arteries, and we'll talk about that. What we would do is see that child at birth, uh, or when, if we, if we had a prenatal diagnosis, or if we were alerted to the fact that there was congenital heart disease because of a degree of cyanosis at birth, or shortly thereafter, or a murmur from the right ventricular outflow tract turbulence, we would make the diagnosis, and then our plan would be to repair the child using conceptually this approach when we could do it in a safe form electively. So if we had a child who was, didn't have a lot of left to right shunting because there was some degree of pulmonary stenosis, but not so much pulmonary stenosis to make them excessively uh, cyanotic, um, we would watch that child. And then the approach that we've adopted um, currently at Children's Hospital Boston is sometime at an age when you could safely perform reparative surgery, we would do it at that time so as not to subject the right ventricular muscle to a long period of time where it would be hypertrophied and might um, develop some secondary problems of fibrosis. Um, and so we would think about doing the surgery relatively early. We would want to do it at an early age in addition because if the infundibular narrowing got worse, um, the child would be subject, subject to um, hypercyanotic episodes where there would be periods of extreme desaturation which might not um, be healthy in terms of neuro and cognitive development. Um, and so our general approach would be at, let's say, four to six months, we would undergo reparative surgery, which would consist of closing the ventricular septal defect and relieving the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The right ventricular outflow tract obstruction would have to be examined carefully. If it were um, just some prominent muscle bundles, maybe they would be resected. More often than not,
an infundibular patch. Let's just go back here, put our pulmonary valve back. An infundibular patch is often needed because the, remember the underlying anatomy, the anterior, superior, and rightward deviation of the conal septum makes this area hypoplastic and needs to be expanded to allow free blood flow, free flow of blood from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. So virtually all children will need that. The tricky point in our current handling of tetralogy of Fallot is what to do with the pulmonary annulus and the pulmonary valve. In the days as plans for surgery matured, um, and let's get through to the early 1970s, actually probably for 25 years, through the mid-1990s, there was a tendency to say pulmonary regurgitation is well handled and pulmonary stenosis may not be. And so we were pretty free in putting in big transannular patches, making sure there was no problem getting blood flow from the right ventricle to the pulmonary arteries, and thinking that the volume load inherent in that kind of approach, that is free pulmonary regurgitation, would be well handled. It's become clear now that a substantial subset of patients, if you leave them with lots of pulmonary regurgitation for decades, or maybe only a decade and a half, that pulmonary regurgitation will result in right ventricular dilation, which then may cause some pulmonary regurgitation, um, some tricuspid regurgitation, and lead to long-term problems with um, heart rhythm and long-term um, right ventricular dysfunction. And so there has been a, ten, a trend in recent years to trying not to put this big transannular patch, but instead to see if we could use a infundibular patch if needed, deal with what we often see as some supravalvar pulmonary stenosis, perhaps with a second patch, and try to preserve pulmonary valve function. So, uncomplicated tetralogy of fellow, and we haven't talked about a lot of other potential complications. One ventricular septal defect, well-developed pulmonary arteries, a modest degree of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction with a decent sized pulmonary annulus. We, would, we will recognize that child as a newborn because of perhaps a bit of cyanosis, maybe cyanosis when the child cries and, in, and there is more right to left shunting. We will recognize that child because there is turbulent flow across the right ventricular outflow tract as there is a murmur. And when we do that, we will do diagnostic studies, predominantly an echocardiogram, and if everything looks favorable, one VSD, reasonable size branch pulmonary arteries, reasonable size annulus, we will electively refer that child for surgical repair, close the ventricular septal defect, place, do what we need to to reconstruct the right ventricular outflow tract, and do that before there has been the development of secondary problems such as excessive right ventricular hypertrophy with fibrosis um, before the child develops hypercyanotic episodes, um, and one could argue uh, before the secondary um, effects on the heart lead to secondary effects on other organs. Kidneys, perhaps lungs, probably most important, uh, the brain. Um, in terms of prolonged periods of desaturation and cyanosis. Um, and that would be the current approach to Tetralogy of Fallot, uncomplicated, no complications with the ventricular septum, no complications with the branch pulmonary arteries. And one other important fact, which I'll mention briefly here, um, is that Tetralogy, kids with Tetralogy of Fellow have a higher incidence than the normal population of having unusual branching patterns of the coronary arteries.
And the reason that that becomes important is if you're putting a patch over here, um, it's in the free wall of the right ventricle, and that is usually a pretty safe place. However, something like 5% of kids with Tetralogy of Fellow have the left anterior descending coronary artery. That is the coronary artery that supplies the interventricular septum. Normally, that arises as a branch of the left coronary artery. There's another branch, the circumflex, that comes over here. The right coronary artery will go behind everything and supply the right ventricle. 5% of kids with Tetralogy of Fallot will have this left anterior descending coronary artery arise from the right coronary artery. And that coronary artery, the anterior descending, will, has the potential for running right where you want to put this Adflow track patch. Point of clarification. It is important to note that in cases in which the left anterior descending coronary artery arises from the right coronary artery, many patients will require placement of a conduit from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery instead of opening and patching the right ventricular outflow tract. And so it is something even when you have what I'm calling simple tetralogy of fellow, it's one of the things that you have to know. So, you, so it does not complicate surgical repair. And if you're doing something truly elective, uh, it's, you want to make sure that you know exactly what's going on. Um, so because some of the ways of handling this um, involve surgical maneuvers and procedures that may not be best performed on a two-month-old. Um, and you might change your treatment strategy based on that small um, but highly critical um, variant of anatomy. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.